So now it turned 11 o'clock UAE time. That means we are ready to start this live event. Welcome to the event. My name is Matt Swinder. I've been looking forward to see you today. And uh, the event today is about uh, buyer enablement, uh, especially with the perspective of the B2B salesperson. But honestly, there is a lot of learnings as well from uh, uh, for B2C, but even more, I think, also, of course, uh, B2G, even when you're selling to the government. But uh, also, we can learn a lot from B2C because all of us uh, participating today, we are by some way, we are buyer or consumer buying, and we all know what disturbs us. And we can take that, and in, in some scale or in scope, of course, it's bigger and more complicated with B2B. But actually, I think we all try it. Buying something for our house can be even more complicated uh, than buying big solutions in the company because there's a lot of emotions in, involved in this. So uh, actually, this session is about the topic called by enablement with the perspective of the B2B selling and marketing, of course, but we'll especially be focusing on, uh, on the sales part because um, honestly, sometimes I am I'm out of the sales world. I know a lot about marketing, but I am out of the sales world. And honestly speaking, a lot of times in this uh, digital world, changing, changing a lot with a lot of transformations, it sometimes seems a little like marketing has taken over. Everything is about online marketing, digital marketing, and then it will solve everything. But honestly, it does not. There is still a lot to do for us in the sales. Luckily, we will not be, uh, there's no still use for us, and that's great. I'm so lucky to have a, a, a webcast together with one of my European friends, uh, Hans. And what we do there every Friday morning, we check in for 10 minutes about uh, how to bridge between sales and marketing. And actually that bridge between sales and marketing is by far one of the biggest challenges in B2B selling today. Uh, how do we actually bridge that? Uh, because we do a lot of marketing activities, but we also have sales and how do we connect them and, and how well can it work? So we'll get into all this stuff today and we'll be right down also to behavior for salespeople. Those of you out there either responsible or yourself uh, being a salesman, you will get some points of how you can actually chip better into the, to the buyer enablement process. But today we're gonna go through very shortly a little research done uh, in a European or Danish study, international study that tells a little about what is actually doing, what, what, who will be the winners in the B2B selling. After that research, we'll go directly down to buy enablement. And the reason for that is actually some of the conclusions, some of the, uh, the, the questions and the answers from the research shows that buy enablement is one of the most important things for sales organization uh, to look upon. When we go down into buy enablement, we'll go through what it is. Uh, and there's no only way of defining it, but we'll define it and we'll go to, into some structure about what it actually is and how we work with it. And then we will deep dive a little longer down to what kind of behavior we actually could see beneficially from our salespeople, not from the marketing, because marketing have so many tools and they're already chipping into a lot of this. But now we need to bridge the gap between sales and marketing. Honestly, one of the things is that you out there, whether you're from sales or you're from marketing, you're in a company that is totally dependent on that your function selling works. That means wherever you're from sales and marketing, this is not about responsibility. This is about working together. And that's one of the main conclusions in this, that sales is no longer a department. It's a function between all these people in the organization. And the reason for that is also, and I'll put it now and I'll come back to that, purchasing is no longer a department. It is actually a function of a lot of people in a big company. Uh, and you'll get a little shock, I think, when you see uh, some figures about uh, this process. But let's go into this research study just before going into buy enablement. Who will be the winners of B2B sales? If you want that report, uh, my colleague Mark, he will be taking care of the chat and Mark will make sure that you'll get the report in an email afterwards. That means you get the report, you can deep, uh, deep dive into it, see more about what it actually shows, very interesting things. Today, I'll only go through the, the main topics about it uh, because they are the foundation of buyer enablement. The reason for the research and the reason for buyer enablement is definitely three things has changed. Not only 
during or due to COVID-19. This has changed anyway, but maybe it was speeding up. We don't know, we all, we all think so, but let's forget about that because it doesn't really make sense what happened because it happened. So what we talk about here is customer behavior in B2B selling has changed. The three most relevant things to understand is that we have accelerated the digitalization. That means what we have seen is that sales has become even more digitized. That means that buyers are buying a lot more digital. They want to research themselves. They want to get information. They want to order. They want to service report. They want to do a lot of things. And that has accelerated. And what is interesting is that even more complex products has gone more online. Maybe not the entire process, but more of this has gone online. That means bigger machines, buying cars, buying a lot of things has gone online. And that, of course, challenges a lot for, for us as salespeople because they don't want to speak with us. They speak with themselves or a system. That's great in some ways, but that calls for an, a necessary change in B2B selling. And then the main fact, information overload is top of mind for buyers. One of my very good friends, Matt Dixon, who wrote the book, uh, Challenge Customer and Challenge, Challenger Sales and also Effortless Experience. He's bringing out a new study in September, a new book. And in that book, they, they actually, they have studied 2.5 million conversations during COVID and recorded them and put them into AI machine learning and found out what actually works and what doesn't work. And one of the things for sure is information overload is a big problem in the sales uh, process together with the buyers. Because when you get overloaded with information, you lose your direction and you get in a position where you say, I stay. Your brain suddenly tells you, don't do anything, just stay because it's, it's too complicated. And I think we all know it. Try to imagine that you're buying something for your, your house yourself and you really feel you're just about to do the right thing. And then suddenly you see that you're, you're buying a simple thing, but suddenly you see that, I, I can tell you an example. I was about to, about to buy some uh, white uh, people stone, uh, people stones to, for my garden this weekend. And uh, I checked the price on the internet. And then suddenly I got eight different prices. I got 12 different products. I got some blog posts telling why I shouldn't use the white and the black instead. And suddenly what happened on the Saturday was no decision. And that is one of the main things about this. Right now, it's information overload. And that sometimes uh, gives a problem because people don't make decisions. So actually, we have to learn. This is, I know all of you have heard about the customer journey. We come back to that. Uh, the customer journey calls for a guide. And that's, we're back to traveling in old days before people could travel themselves. We always needed a guide. A guide that took care of us in the airport, checking us in, putting us through security, taking care when we arrived, putting us in a bus to go to a hotel, checking what we should do while we were there, checking we came back to the airport, a guide. And I think we're going to see that salespeople today are going to transform into, instead of selling and trying to push because that actually damaged the sales process a lot more, there'll be more guides. Uh, they're guiding actually the customers, but I come back to that a little later. So these three changes, they call for a change. What we did is we also asked, and I'll put this in a bigger box here. We asked the, the sales organizations, what are you going to focus on for the next period? And what you see here is two things is very interesting. First of all, it's very diverse what they're going to look for. And you also see there is a kind of uncertainty. We really don't know what is the most important thing to focus on to increase our sales in the coming period. And we see that even five, six points here, uh, our agenda are like 50% said this was important. That means we're gonna focus on leadership, teamwork, digitalization, sure we are, but a lot of things. So what we're actually leaving is, we're leaving sales organizations with a lot of job to do to try and out, find out where to focus. Once again, you can get more information about the research, but it's very interesting. And I can tell you one thing, those organizations trying to adapt and focus on biomet, they will be successful because we see that four things are actually defining the winners. 
First of all, they have an omni-channel sales approach. That means we're not only selling through a walking man with a bag going out and presenting products as salesmen. We're not only selling with marketing. We have a lot of channels, tech, chat function, online ordering, uh, and a lot of things that we can do also when we, when we talk about the salesman, the pre-sales, the after-sales, there are so many channels that we can work with and we need to have them. And that actually combines with the second one. Sales is a team sport. You'll see that later today as well. It's not a single man's job. It's a team sport that we're actually working together with this. So it's very important that we understand we have a lot of channels. How do we use them? We sell as a team. It's not a single man. And that might call for somebody looking for the compensation scheme, the salary scheme, because very often the B2B outgoing salesman, he gets a lot of compensation or bonus from selling. But if we want to create a team, sales team as a, as a team game, then we have to get rid of that. We have to have more team bonus, engage people. Maybe we can share in different sizes, meaning that somebody driving around get on one piece, but you also get another thing from creating much more teamwork and proudness, you get people to be responsible for each other. That means it's easier actually with the next one, sales management competences. Uh, very often we focused on the sales leader, the sales manager, somebody measuring number of meetings, number of calls. Today, the sales manager create the team, the sales manager create the, the passion, the sales manager help with the process. So that means that, that the traditional process of having a successful salesman and put him or her in front of the sales organization, that might not work anymore. Uh, just like you see, look, look around in, in football. Take the biggest coach, coaches in the world, club in Liverpool, Ancelotti in Real Madrid. You can take them anywhere. Were they really famous players? Some of them, to some instinct they were, to some level. But what they actually can do, they can create a team. They can create responsibility. They can develop. And the days where we just promoted the best salesperson to be a sales manager, I have to tell you, they're long gone. But it seems like some B2B companies don't understand it. They're still promoting the best salesperson to be the sales manager. And unfortunately, what you do is you're creating two problems. You're losing the best salesman, and you're not necessarily promoting the best sales leader. So instead of doing that, you have to have leaders that actually understand how to lead, how to engage, how to develop, how to understand process, how to make people work together. So that's one of the points you understand. So if you are a sales leader out there, you might even be promoted from, for being the best salesman. Sorry for that. Then you have to learn that your job as a sales leader is not to lead the sales people, but to lead the sales as a process. Understand that you're leading the process. And that's a very important part to understand. And then coming back to the last and fourth point of the research showing that mental health and a strong culture. In a lot of companies, it's always survival of the fittest. It's a one man game, lonely wolf. It doesn't work anymore. First of all, generations coming now. Uh, I hope I see that Omar is saying no uh, voice. I hope you hear me, Omar. Uh, and, and please uh, give me a, a head job if there's any problem. Mark, you can do that. Uh, it's clear. Thank you so much. Uh, so what we actually see is mental health and strong culture. It's not a lonely wolf game. We need to, to change the culture. We need to create balanced people because there's a lot of changes coming on. So anyway, this is what it shows. So now let's go into buyer enablement. And I the reason for going into buyer enablement, I will show you in a second. Three numbers that you're really going to know. These three facts you should remember. 77% of B2B customers rate purchasing as very difficult. That means three out of four buyers, they think that the process of buying in B2B is complicated, extremely actually complicated. That means we're not creating a smooth transaction. We're giving them trouble. That gives them all option all options to go to somebody else. That's really a big problem. The second one, in the process of buying, before actually having your, bought your product, that means in the process of defining and deciding 
17% of the time in the buying process is spent with sellers. That in 83% of the time, you are without contact to the buyers. Only 17% of the time, the sales people and the sales organization will be engaged. What is going on in these 83% of the time? We're gonna go into that today because the better we know what's going on, the better we can help them. But it also leaves us with the fact that we have to have an extremely high impact on the 17% of time, because you, you have to compensate for a long time being out of the game. So that actually really, really calls for you being very close by. And then the last one, uh, I think I, I made a small mistake, it's 6%, that's wrong. It's actually 86% assesses the amount of information unmanageable. What does that mean? That means nearly all B2B decision makers or part of making decisions, they find that information load is too heavy and it's very difficult to structure and manage. And it calls for one good thing and one bad thing. It calls for them not to decide to go to anybody new supplier. They stay with the solutions they have. And that means for us, and we all know that for us who wants to sell, it's a big problem to win new leads because they find it difficult to decide what to do. And that's actually a huge problem when we are lead generating and, and, and generating new customers. Uh, but it's also good in some ways you can say, the more complicated it is to change, the easier it is to get your people, to, your customers to stay. But it's a bad situation because this also happened when they had to buy again from you. How do they actually get a manageable information load? But we get into that because selling is, of course, new selling to new business or doing new business. It's also retention, keeping our, our clients and our customers in the portfolio so we don't lose them. Why? Because you just see it here. It is so complicated to win new customers. And very often when I see this, we spend a lot of energy winning new business. Of course, if we are a new business, we are starting up, we have to do that. But when we establish company, we see that, of course, you should do a lot to make people stay with you, sell more, do cross-selling, do upselling, because it's actually very complicated. It's a tough game to win orders. So this actually calls for action in a lot of places, because let's go to the day, to the topic of today, by enablement. How do we actually define it? This is our definition of buyer enablement. It's methods and mentality to make it easy to buy and buy again. And when I talk about this, I talk about methods. Methods here can be our systems, our digital and online marketing system, our CRM system, our ordering system, our online shopping, our web shop, our customer service portal, all these things that makes it easy to buy. That is one point, that's without people. And then it's the mentality. And I'll give you one example here. If I was in an unlucky situation that my horse or my dog uh, got out of leech and I couldn't control it, the worst thing I can ever do is to chase it. The best thing I can do is to run away. Because the minute I start running away, it will go for me. The minute I chase it, it will go away. That's exactly the same with bias. And honestly, what we see is the old school of selling, really selling, it's out of fashion today. It's, it's not the style to do. Nobody wants to be sold to. We want to buy. So when I talk about mentality, you in your company has to change the culture from speaking so much about selling to speaking much more about how can we make it easy to buy? What can I do to make this travel easy for my buyers? What can I do to make it easy to understand my meeting? What can I do to make it easy to make a decision? What can I do to make it easy to understand my presentation? That means in all our mindset, we have to stop talking too much about selling. We talk a lot about the old ABC, always be closing. Always be closing is chasing your customers. Chase customers, they will hurry away. So if you change this to ABC is not always be closing, it's always be caring. 
means you really care for them. You want to be and you want to really care. And I think, I know when, when we have events like this, a lot of people also join the events to, to, to get somebody to know them. I see also on this list today, there's a couple of consultants and you're so welcome here. But understand, the more you try to sell, the less you sell. And the minute you stop selling, you start selling. And I mean that by the minute you start putting pressure on people, you actually start them feel that they are in, in a good company with you. They feel trust, they feel safe. But the problem is when somebody raised the business card saying, salesman, we all get like this. So here it starts with mentality. Methods, they're easy to create. They're so easy to design. They're so easy to define. But it's the mentality behind it. Of course, you want to reach results. Of course, you should look like you want really to work with that client. But you have to stop pushing the sales too hard because nobody wants that. That's also one of the things in, in the research from uh, coming in September, the YOLT effect by Matthew Dixon. You should really write that down coming in September. My friend Matthew Dixon, an amazing author uh, and, re and scientist as well. And Matthew is doing this, the YOLT effect. And the YOLT effect actually shows that the worst thing you can try to do is to push somebody to make a decision. Second is that you try to show them consequences of not buying, meaning that if you don't buy my product, you're going to be in a big problem. Nobody wants to be scared. They want to be taken care of. So what you have to start with is internally. That's why I go back to this one. What you actually have to understand, I said here, I talked about the mental health and a strong culture. I talked about sales management competences. We have to change this because we need to change the culture, not to speak so much about selling, but speak more about how we make people buying, proud of buying. And that we have to learn from a lot from the B2C, because when I go into a mall, they're really trying to make it easy to be there. They're trying to make it easy to go in the shop. And the funny thing is when I go in there and they just meet me relaxed, they're not trying to push me. They're trying to understand me. Do I go for a specific product or do I just need to look around or do I have some options? If the better they know about me, and that's a mentality, the better they want to know me, uh, the more you can help people to buy. And now we're already approaching what is called buy enablement. So. What we talk about here is not only methods, it's also about mentality. And I'll come back to that a little later. So the last part here before going into talking about buyer enablement, that is buyer enablement is actually triology. It's, it's the center of three very important things. It's the center of the customer journey. I go back into that a little later. It's the center of the sales process because it actually where the customer journey and the sales process get aligned that's actually where we're starting the point of building uh, buyer enablement. That one we're going into today because it's a, such an important uh, gap here we have to bridge. And then of course, sales enablement. How do we make it easy for our sales people to do the sales process with the right data, the right fact, the right presentation? And, and uh, then how do we actually make it easy to understand the journey? Uh, understand the journey for, for being uh, in enablement, that means how do we actually identify it? Uh, and that gives us a lot of insights, insights from the journey that we put into sales enablement, these sales enablement we put into the sales process and then we can align the process with the journey. And then we have a sweet spot. That sweet spot is very important, but that means we have to understand these things in the beginning. So what I'll do here is I'll just shortly get out of the slide uh, deck here. We have to understand where we are today. This is a process here of buying. Buying process. Buying process means something is going on. We see that, first of all, there is a process before I buy. This is where I go into a process of getting information, being aware, understanding what's going on. In this solid process here, I'm actually trying to consider and understand what to do. Then the minute I come to this point, I buy. In the buying process now, it of course is a contract negotiation, uh, onboarding people, they set the product. 
Here it's all about making them love us to understand how easy it is to buy. Here it's about making them successful, and then we want to make them buy again. Because buy again, if we don't do it right, they will have to start all over again. So here we have to, to, to work with retention. Uh, how do we actually keep them in our company? And here we work a lot with onboarding them, uh, how to make it easy. So buyer enablement, of course, is the total process. But it's especially here also in the information steps where people get into a position in a journey here, the beginning of the customer journey. How do we actually make it easy? How do we make it definitely easy to understand this process and to buy here? Because the more we can do here, we can help them to go to the tipping point. That's where we want them to go here and make a decision. One of the big problems is, take a look. Now, now, now this is the first small exercise you can do in your, uh, your own organization. First of all, look upon your marketing material. How much do you actually in your material tell about all the benefits they get when they buy? How much do you talk about all the pains they will solve when they buy? We come back to that because a lot of companies, they talk so much about the situation after buying. But the problem is, if I'm stuck here and I don't pass from here to here, I'll never get to buy. So first of all, try to evaluate your, your, your materials. How much are you talking about what will happen when they buy? And how little do you actually speak about what it takes to buy? Because if you only speak about what happened after, how do you get there? That's a little like I see it very often when I buy something myself. When people start talking about the pain and the gain, but they don't help me to buy, then I, uh, I stop. And uh, when it gets too complicated, I'm out of here. And you know that even when you're ordering online, if it's too complicated, you're out. Even that product could be great. So here, first of all, try to evaluate your materials. How much do you speak about what to do? And how little do you speak about what to do? Do you speak about the pain and the gain? Too much. And now it's more complicated. Mentality, behavior. What do your sales guys speak about when they meet the client? When they speak about, when they speak with people in the first step, that could be following up on lead that has been nurtured in lead agency and in lead or online marketing. How do they follow up? Do they start to push for sale in the beginning? I see a lot of them. I very often I'm called for my company as well. I'm called by somebody said, we got you on a list. And they call me, they want to sell. The minute they stop selling and starting caring about me, understanding me, they got a bigger chance to win because I've already signed up. I already signed up that they can contact me. So don't push me too hard because if you push me too hard, you don't get me here. Second is when I go to a meeting, what do I do when I'm in the meeting? I'll come back to that a little later because very often people go there, push the sales. Even that we know the sales cycle in B2B selling has been longer and longer and longer. Some, in some businesses, you can speak about your own process. How long do you expect this line from first contact to signing a contract? How long do you expect it to be? It's very often between six and 12 months in a, in a B2B sales. So what happening is, if you start pushing sales here, trying to get order, people don't want to be in the same room as you because they get enough of you. You don't build trust. You don't build rapport. You don't build understanding. You're trying to sell and you shouldn't sell. You should make it out of sell, but make it easy to buy. So this is a mindset change. And I can train your people to do that. And if you're interested, this is also where you start building your playbook, your sales playbook, because what you have to do here is just like I talked about football before, you have to design the way you play your game. And Mark, my friend, will in the chat function share a very, very easy way to get started with a playbook. I remember, you never, never, never finished with that sales playbook, sales and marketing playbook. But we share an access where you can actually sign up to get a free start of a playbook to design and define what steps, what action, what behavior do we take to make it easy to buy and stop selling. 
Because the minute you stop selling, you start selling. That's so crazy, right? But you understand it. It's a little like a double twist here. The more you put pressure, the worth it goes. So you have to stop it here. And in case you are the sales manager, and try to imagine, I was in the sales organization where a sales guy, he came home after a first meeting. I was having a, a coaching session with the sales manager and we went out and we spoke to the sales guy and uh, the sales manager asked him, how was the meeting? It was a first, first time meeting with a new potential lead, a new prospect. And the sales guy said, oh, it was a great meeting. And then the sales manager, maybe to impress me, he asked the next question, did you get an order? Did you get an order in a business where it takes like eight months to get an order? This was the first meeting. You see how crazy it is. Honestly, if you do that, if you do that as a sales manager, you're calling for the old behavior of old days. Better questions here could be, that's interesting. You had a great meeting. What did you learn about the business? What did you understand of the buying process? How far are they now? Who will be engaged? You see, this is just four questions. And if you want to learn them, you'll be lucky because we are actually today giving away five workshops where you can sign up with you and your team. We have some demands for you, but Mark will sooner, uh, a little later, sorry, a little later, he will uh, give you an invitation for that workshop. Five of you are so lucky to get a workshop for you and your team uh, where I can inspire you. What questions do we ask you, actually ask here? Because a lot of your salespeople, they are excused. They've been learned in an old way how to do it. And they've been learned always to close and they should learn to love and care. That is a mindset shift. And it's a special shift when we are, when we are seeing, I was four days ago, I was in the souk here in Dubai. In the souk, of course, people attack me because I'm passing by. The process from here to here is very short. That is different. But in B2B selling is pretty complicated. The next complicated thing about it is, except from the long process, between six to 10 persons are involved in this between six to 10 persons. And when I speak to salespeople, they very often only speak to one or two. I better hope they are speaking to the right person. I better hope they know who the other are because now we are back to what kind of information, what kind of question you can do and how sales and marketing can work together. Because try to imagine that we have uncovered all these people here. And we're not only talking about six to 10 persons, it could be six to 10 departments in a big organization, governmental organization. Try to imagine that we uncovered all these. We got them signed up for our newsletter, for our marketing. We got them signed up for our webinar, for our videos, our guides. We got them signed up for everything. Try to imagine what power of influence we have if you do that. That's really where we can do a difference, right? So here we actually have to understand if we can do this in the right way, we get a good chance to influence. But if we do it in the old way, hoping that the person I am connected to has the power to go through with it. Honestly, this is old school selling. So we have to learn it's different today. So this was the first step. We have to understand we're not talking about the buying now, we're talking about how we get them to buy. We're not talking about how to buy again because that some ways follows this process so we can do it here in the same way. And that's why talking about after sales, onboarding is so important to have that kind of retention in our process. Okay, let's stop this process here. This is very important. Let's go down to the next one. Now we go a little deeper into buyer enablement, but before that, I'll go very shortly into to this model here. Some of you have probably seen that because it's these glasses, I would say, are the two perspectives. You see two glasses to look upon the world as a sales and marketing organization. We have to get new customers and we have to keep existing customers. The process is very easy and you see it is like an arrow. There's a direction around starting down with the trigger, the in initial con consideration, going to an active evaluation, purchase decision, getting an experience, creating loyalty, and hopefully they stay in the loop of being existing customers. They could unfortunately go into the gray area and go out again. When we look upon this, I see a lot of activity in the left side here on doing with working with the new customers. 
a lot of activity trained to uh, generate leads, uh, speak to people, have a lot of lead lists, and that's great. We have to remember there are some steps here. We trigger them, then what happens is they get aware of us, they start considering, and at a certain point they show interest, and then what they do is they're trying to put the preferences down into a situation where they can take a decision. And buyer enablement is making the process for new customers easier than ever, easier than ever. So what we will do is we'll actually now go into this because we see some steps here. We do trigger them. Yes, sure we do. We do make them aware of our awareness. Yes, sorry for that. Trigger, awareness, consider, and then consideration here, and then definitely preferences, what to do. These are the steps they're running through. The problem is that we are so focused in our sales and marketing that we want, we want to show this from an inside out perspective. We, we tell, we want to trigger you, we want to get you aware, we want to make you consider, we want you to create preferences. Buyer enablement is, as I said, method and mentality. And now we change it 180 degrees. Because what we have to do is, we have to understand not what we are doing. That's the same process. We are planning, I want to do this to trigger, I want to do this to make them aware, I want to do this to make them consider, I want to do this to make them build preferences yes but what are the buyers doing at the time this is a little like i need to understand what they what they actually are doing to know how i can help them if selling is to make people help to buy help people to buy then i need to understand what they're doing and let's start here what are they actually doing here what they do in the first step is they identify a problem. Identify a problem comes from this situation. There's a breakdown on our old machine and we get an idea that renovating is, is very costful. It might be a better idea to buy a new one. We get an idea that our old HR system doesn't apply to new uh, compliance rules. So we see that we have an issue with the build on the system or buy a new one. What's getting on here is we are getting some kind of a pain. And what we try to understand is pain and gain. That is the problem identification. I talked to you before and said that very often we speak a lot about what you can get and what you can avoid. That is also very often, very often where it starts. I think actually some of you that have seen or uh, videoed uh, Simon Sinek, he says it all starts with a why. And that's totally right. It starts with a why, but it doesn't end there. Because if you only give them the why, that is not enough. And here what we see is, of course, here we identify the problems they are in. We are showing them what they could get. But we also have to show the empathy that we know the problem. So when we do marketing here, and of course we do marketing here, because what we do is we do blog posts. We do videos, we do webinars, just like I do with you now. We show on videos what we can, what we can do here. We give them social media posts telling that something is wrong. And if you know about this, it could be solved and the pain could go away and the gain could come. That's where we promote ourselves. At that time, we don't speak so much directly. Remember the 17%, only 17% of the time they want to speak to sellers or the guiding buyer guide, the, the buyer guide, that's a better word for salesperson. Why don't you call your salespeople for buyer guides? Because what they do is actually guide people to buy, they don't sell. So here in the beginning, identify a problem. What they're doing here is they're searching the internet. They're looking at anything. They are in an early stage to make it easy for them to understand and stay a little away personally. If they want to chat, on your website, Omnichannel, you definitely need to have a chat function because they are still on early stage. But make these chat people sitting there, make sure they don't tell them, don't try to sell. They should guide them how to buy. And the better they are to guide them to buy, 
the more successful you'll be. Because now we have to move on to the next step. The next step of this uh, here is they want to explore solution. They want to know about the solution. So when we hear talk about the pain and the gain and the why, the notes want to know what can help. Because when you create a headache, and that's what we're doing, and that's one of the main things from that book from Matt Nixon, The Dual Effect. That tells that we're trained to create a pain in early stage, and that's okay. But the minute you create a pain that is too big and you make it too complicated, I stay where I am because I'm afraid of making a mistake. So here you have to explain me more about what solution could possibly help you. What is the exploration? Here what you start doing is you still do webinars, you do business cases, you start telling them with white papers and guide, guidelines how you create solutions that can help this pain go away. And if, and if your people start speaking to them personally over the phone, online meetings, face to face, they need to be explainers based on the pain and gain, but they need to understand as well what's actually happening here in that company, what would be the right solution for them. And one of the things is at this point, don't try to sell your product, just explain to them what solution can help here. If you have a CM problem, you cannot send out digital marketing. There are solutions that can help you. These solutions do like this and this and this. You do tutorials to explain them because the minute they feel, wow, this is a good solution. They feel safe and they get relief, pain relief, meaning that they are one step closer to having a solution that they actually can use. I'll come back to that because we have some underlying uh, aspects here as well. After solution, is explored, then they really want to do something else. They want to do requirement building because now they've been told about all the solutions. And honestly, when you're told about solutions from our traditional sage people, they are overwhelming you. They are trying to impress you. You shouldn't try to impress, you should try to inspire. So what you do is here, you help them to requirement build. So actually, what would be the right solution for me? How could I get this solution? What you can do here is you can make them have spreadsheets in which they can build their own solution. They might have uh, ROI uh, calculators, a return on investment, calculating with their own number of people. If it was an HR system, we talked about the pain here. We talked about what kind of solution can help. Now we have to build requirements for exactly my company. 50 people, how many is white color? How many is black color? That means what we actually can do now is we can make people understand exactly how we, how we uh, built the right solution. Because a lot of us, and that is understanding the brain. Some of you participated in my neuroscience uh, live event that will be back right after summer. What is happening now is when we're in this process and we all know it, we are so afraid of not getting what we expected. We are so afraid of having a bad situation that it actually sometimes forces us to what is called status quo. Then we're back to Matt Dixon's book because it actually shows the more you push on pain and gain in this process, the more people stay to status quo. So get relaxed, meet them where they are. Requirement building is actually building an understanding. Sorry, one second and understanding of their business, making solutions for them. So now we have the personal guide. And one of the things that create the best trust, that's actually when you tell people, there are two solutions for you. One is the big solution, a little more expensive. And the other one, that is actually one I recommend for your business, because you'll get fully started, you get a solid solution, and you don't need the rest. And in case you need them later on, you can always expand it. So please start with the more medium sized because it's better for your business. Don't sell too much because what happens if they buy too much? And I've done it myself so many times. I buy two big solutions. I get so disappointed every time I look at these products that I bought, I get oh, a bad confidence saying, wow, what actually happened here? So 
Here we talk about identify the problem, fill the problem with marketing, understanding here is the issue, you can pay, you can get why, solution experience, tell them how, how solutions are made, references, uh, business cases, white paper, guideline, requirement building, help them to specify the solution, make it easy to click on that, click on that. You see, when you order a car, I think the car business really here can inspire us. When I order a car, I go to, let's say, Volvo's homepage. And when I go to Volvo's homepage, I say, I want this car. Then I can specify the color, the interior, the exterior, the engine. And every time I do something I put in, I can see prices changing up and down. That is requirement building. I already there because I identified the problem. I know now about the solutions to have. Now we go to the next step. How do we actually build requirements? That means the guide of the salesman sitting there, he must be a really strong guide, guiding them through what is the right thing to do. So what they are up to do now after requirement is built, because we have to understand what they need to do with these requirements in the second. Then what we have to do now is choose supplier. Supplier selection. And this is a difficult part because maybe they know your competitor from before, but they don't know you. So now you have to be very honest and open and explaining, even maybe in a spreadsheet or in a table, putting up. And I think we can learn from, from a lot of the SaaS companies here. The SaaS companies, uh, if I go to any CM system, I'm just mentioning now the, the HubSpot, Active Campaign, whatever. If I go to one of these pages, they very often compare with the four or five biggest competitors. What do we have? What do they have? Sometimes they lose a little, sometimes they win. I know they're all trying to promote, but what they're actually trying to do is give me an overview because then I know from my requirements, from my solution experience, requirements building, I know what I get and what I do not get. So what we're building here is what you get and how you get and what is the right thing to do. So here we really have to help them. If you're in a business where you cannot name your competitor, you could be the medium-sized uh, supplier. You can, you can compare to a bigger or smaller. If you're the bigger, you can compare to smaller and medium. If you're the minor, you can compare, but do some comparison. Help them to compare to select because here you have actually some angles we need to understand. They go here. There are two very important blocks here. And these are what you do all the time. There are two things we need to do down here. First of all, we need to help them to validate. During the entire process, they need to skits down here and see, does this ID, pro uh, sorry, identification of problem, what is the validation here? Because now we need to know these six to 10 persons. Do they have the same need? Do they have the same pain? No. So here I can actually speak to them in different situations. I can speak to them about in my marketing. I can tailor my marketing to five different uh, people in a company. And that's why going back to the HR software system, try to imagine there's an HR manager, there's a, a financial officer, there's maybe a salesperson, sales manager, there might be a CEO, there might be somebody from uh, safety. These five are all interested in an HR system working, but they have different pain and gains. They have different things they want to benefit. So when we explain here, we need to understand who they are, what they feel, what they think. The same when we present solution. We can talk about solution from uh, how it can actually uh, work together with plugins for different system, how it can connect to their, what it should, how it can give us data of different things. But if we put everything in one box, we miss because then we have what I talked about. I'll go up here and show you because what they say is information overload. So what is the problem here is the big problem is that they get so much information and maybe they only have to cherry pick one or two points. So here we have to validate do all people in the group of decision makers get exactly what they need? And do we bring the needs to the requirement building so all of them could say, wow, it's validated. This will actually supply our need. This will actually support what we want to get. 
And on this last page here, how can we make sure that we choose the right supplier, whether we are in the financing, in the budgeting, in the IT system, uh, we need to integrate. So we need to help them to make it easy to buy. That is the entire process. That's why it's a team game, because we need to understand it's not safe people alone. And then comes here the point. We have to create consensus. I'll just go to the next one, because then you can see it here. It's on this slide. You see what we do. We identify problem. Why should we do something seen from the buyer's perspective? Understand solution. What can we do and how does it work? Build requirement. What is the right solution for us? Select supplier. How will we, how will be the best to help? Who will be the best to help us and what should they do? Then we validate, make sure we know all about the problem, all about solution, all about requirements, all about supplier. And then the last one, build consensus. That means, remember I said 17%, 83% of the time, this, this group of buyers are by themselves. At that time, they are struggling and fighting to create consensus. What we can do here is, we can give them tools. That means we could give the HR manager tools, how to speak with finance, how to speak with IT. We could give IT tools, how to speak with finance, how to speak with security or whatever. That means we create tools and agendas that make them help to create consensus. We might even with the salespeople, we might even visit and go and speak with different groups in the company instead of selling product then go out and care for them. Try to go out and interview the IT guy. And you can start saying, let's take an example. The sales guy is now invited on board for the first time. They have identified the problem by themselves. They have solution explored by themselves. And then suddenly, boom, they call for the salesman. Yes, come and see us. The sales guy now do a mistake. I'll go away from this one. You'll get the slides, those of you who want, Mark will send them out to you as well. Uh, and remember, those of you who want to go deeper into a workshop here, uh, you can do that if you sign up for the workshop as Mark uh, told you, he will probably do it again. And as well for the playbook, you have these options uh, to get these tools. But let's say here, the sales guy is now called. Very often what we see is a huge mistake. And I've been really seeing this so many times. Here we see, what we can do is fundamental differences here. We have three possibilities. Here we are very, very focused on the product. Here we are very, very focused on the, so to speak, the relationship or the specific part on how to do it. What we see is the big problem is very often, remember, the sales guy is called at this time. They know all about the pain and the gain and, this, and, and a lot about the solution in generic terms. So what arrives here is what is called a talking brochure. A talking brochure is the old salesman that can go and entertain and amuse. And what he does is he becomes like a joker. But today he doesn't belong to the world of selling. And he doesn't even belong, not anymore, he doesn't belong to being a buyer's guide. Because what he's doing is he's promoting his product. He's very proud of the product, but he's speaking, speaking, speaking. He learned to speak about benefits, but not specific, more generic. And he knows all about the product. And he tells you, this is really quality. Yeah, but I don't care what you talk about your product. You have to understand me instead of understanding your own product. On the other hand, we have here, that can be okay, but it's too early. Somebody who really, really can explain everything about complicated systems and they can construct and they can define anything because they are so product knowledgeable. They know all about the product. And what they do is they scare the customers at that time, especially they scan them because some of the six to 10 people, they're not experts. They want to see experts later on in this session. But if you meet them here at that early stage, you will feel that you're humiliated. They're so, they're so knowledgeable. 
but I don't understand. And then again, going back to Matt Dixon and the Yold effect, what you create now is, oh my, I'm afraid we're doing a mistake here. We stay. The, bet, the worst competitor you have at that stage is status quo, we stay. What you have to have is instead, it's a bias guide. A bias guide that show up here at that stage, sit down, trying to understand who are, what is this company? Who are decision makers? What is the biggest goal they have? What are they trying to achieve? What is their experience with this? What are the criteria for everybody? He's trying to build a consensus. And if you want to build, let's just say the 10 most important questions, because when I do training for people, I see that they don't know what to ask for. So either they fall here and make it complicated, the engineer, or they fall here and make it simple and not motivating, talking about the brochure and the specification. So what we need to train and develop is buyer guides. You need to have buyer guides in your company, in the pre-sales, in the selling, in the after sales. It's a buyer's guide and it's a user's guide. So how can we actually do it? I'll just give you here because we are soon running out of time. I really hope you found this uh, useful. And please, if you want to, to give us some comments in the chat about how you see this, please do that. Because I can tell you, the minute you learn this, guys, the minute you start training in this, you'll get onto the next step. And I'll just try to guide you now what you can do. Here are some steps that you can start with. You can start by understanding your customer's behavior, not their need, because you know it already. The behavior. How do they buy? Who do they speak with? Who do they put in the group? And then you can assess how to meet them in the buy enablement phases. You can try to evaluate. You can actually speak to, as I said in the fourth part here, you can actually start uh, to speak to your clients. You can speak to those orders that you win. Why did they choose you? What did they feel about the process? You can also speak to some of them that you lost. But don't let the sales guy call because he will probably come back and say it's about price. And that is, sorry to say, it's bullshit. So you can speak with somebody that you lost the order and then you can talk more about the buying process in the, than the traditional sales follow-up process. But you're probably always speaking about how many meetings, what is the pipeline, how far did we go? So what you have to, you have to stop talking about selling because then you start selling. So first of all, start by understanding customer behavior, assess how to meet them. How do we meet them today? What do we speak about? Do we only speak about marketing, about pain and gains? Do we also explain them how to buy? Then you can talk more about uh, the buying process in your sales follow-up. Speak about, uh, here again, 10 questions for the sales manager to ask the sales people when they come back from a meeting. And these 10 questions, that could be like, uh, how was the meeting? Uh, what did you get to know about the process? Who are the most important people out there? How, do, how well do we know them? How can, what can we do to influence them? Do we have a chance to gather them for a seminar? Can we send some information? You see, you're talking about what we can do to put it one step further in the process, not about how to close the deal, but one step further. And then you can listen more to your customers' experiences with you uh, and uh, especially also those who leave or you don't win. And then the last part, if you have the courage, and it really takes courage, it doesn't, money is the simplest part of this, but if you have the courage, you can let me and your organization, we can come and help you because I know something we can do. We can build that mentality. And without that mentality, because a lot of your building systems, you have to build mentality. Then you can start building methods, put your sales group together, sales, marketing, pre-sales, whatever, and then build, what you can do of method, method. And then you can start developing skills, attitudes, and competences. We have to learn to learn. We have to learn to learn. That means you can give me a 10 question in a list. Most of your sales people will probably say, oh yeah, I already asked them, but they don't. The brain simply cheat them. It simply tells them, oh yeah, you always ask that because it's so obvious but they don't do because it's not a part of behavior. So we need to practice, practice, practice to get in the right condition to win the game because it calls for change. And then the last part, remember that we choose some of five of you that can be signed up for a workshop where we can get this started. 
And honestly, I know I'm selling a product to you because I want to sell my service. But do you know what will happen if you don't do? Okay, you see what I did now? I'm trying to threaten you. That didn't work, right? So don't do that. You have to work with this because you really want to. You're motivated to do it because if you want to achieve something big, the biggest sports person in the world, they do it because they want to achieve. Do they dare? Do they take risk? Sure they do, but they really want and they're motivated to change. This is all from me today. If any of you want to have the research, Mark will make sure you get a copy of the research. You can also get it on the webpage shown here. And then of course, some of you might have signed up for the playbook and some of you might have signed up. Five of you lucky winners will be that we can make a workshop for you and your company. But don't wait for that. Get started today. Maybe start asking some questions to your salespeople or yourself. How well do I know the sales process? No, sorry, the buying process. Am I a seller or buyer's guide? You should be a buyer guide. And ABC is not for closing. It's always be caring. Have a nice day out there. I really hope to see you later or sooner. And then we can speak how to do it. Thank you so much. Please bring a comment in the, in the chat function. That'll be really nice. See you.